This, this is, is TLV1. The Tel Aviv Review. Hello and welcome to the Tel Aviv Review. I'm your host, Gilad Halper. And I'm your co-host, Dahlia Shenlin. Every week we bring you conversations with authors about the books and research and other things that we like. And if you like us, please consider becoming a Patreon supporter by going to our homepage. That's tlv1.fm slash Tel Aviv Review. Scroll down to the bottom and click the big red button that says Patreon. Click and support us. We're counting on you and every little helps. Today, we're very pleased to welcome Shaul Magid, who joins us today from New York City. He is the Distinguished Fellow of Jewish Studies at Dartmouth College and the Kogod Senior Research Fellow at the Shalom Hartman Institute of North America. He was previously on the faculty of Indiana University, and he was before that the chair of the Department of Jewish Philosophy at the Jewish Theological Seminary. He's a contributing editor to Tablet Magazine and the author of numerous books. Today, we'll be discussing his latest one, which will be published in October. It's already available for pre-order. It's called Mayor Kahana, The Public Life and Political Thought of an American Jewish Radical, published by Princeton University Press. Shaul Magid, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Mayor Kahana is not exactly an obscure figure that you've excavated from the archive. He sometimes feels like a living, breathing force, certainly in Israeli life. But also he is a practically a household name, I would imagine, among American Jews. But one of your key observations is that he's been somewhat neglected in the literature about modern American Jewry. Why do you think that is? Oh, well, that's a good question. And I think you're right. When people think of Mayor Kahana or people hear the name Mayor Kahana now, they very often, even if, even American Jews really think about Israel, either his political party in Israel or his political career in Israel, and um, know much less about his political life, public life and political life in America. And I think the title of the book itself, you know, Mayor Kahana, American Jewish Radical, really kind of speaks to the question that I think that uh, we we um, see Mayor Kahana in some way in reverse, and as we see him as an American Jew who moved to Israel and then began a political party, political movement that, of course, still exists today in some form, and we don't really pay much attention to his American career. And the argument of the book is basically that he's a quintessential American Jew, and that even when he moves to Israel, his the values that he has and the categories of thinking that he has really kind of get transported from America to Israel, which is part of the reason I think he's he's a he's really a political failure in Israel, which I can talk about more. Oh, but you I will. Think his, <laughs> yeah, but I think his influence, his influence um, on American Jewry is 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 quite profound and. Because he is a certain, in a certain way, a persona non grata in American Jewry. I mean, he's, he's really this. The, he's only a neg- negative force for most of for most of uh, of American Jews, and in a certain sense, has kind of been written out of the history of post war American Jewry. I think that we don't recognize the extent to which his worldview has really um, sunk its roots quite deeply into the American Jewish consciousness. Well, one of the things you just said I found interesting for clarification. You said he was the quintessential American Jew, but he's not exactly the typical American Jew, is he? What's the difference? He's not a tip- he's not a typical American Jew, but he is a uh, but he's not atypical for his time uh, in in some way, and in another more strange way, he seems more in line ideologically with certain aspects of American Jewry today than he was back in the 1960s when he was battling against an American Jewish establishment that was actually quite liberal and quite, not assimilationist, but certainly accommodationalist in terms of his understanding of his place in America and quite unwilling to be able to kind of raise issues of American American Jewish pride and American Jewish identity. Uh, and he began talking about this notion of American Jewish survivalism right, that it's about the survival of the American Jew, that in America today has been kind of transformed into a more genteel notion of Jewish continuity. But in a certain sense, Jewish continuity is just another iteration of Jewish survivalism. You, as you point out in the the book, that Kahana wasn't a, a great intellectual, but he had this amazing capacity to see where the wind is blowing. And when it comes to what, and we're going to ask you to uh, unpack that for us in a minute, but I want to dwell on what you just said in, in, in relation to this and, and ask you whether you think that he is a quintessential American Jew only with the benefit of hindsight, because 
to see where uh, American jury, jury was uh, going over the last 50 years uh, could uh, allow you to say that. But was he also a quintessential uh, American Jew back in the 1960s or in 1970s, or is it a transformation that he underwent? Well, that's a, re it's a really good question. I, I think that, um, that, that Kahana is a very particular manifestation of the American Jewish counterculture in the 1960s that usually is understood as being on the left, kind of the, the kind of the new left Jews and the new left that happens after 1962 with the Port Huron statement and the assassination of Kennedy. And what Kahana basically does is he adapts the countercultural project of, uh, of American Jewry on the left, which was really a critique of liberalism. And he then adapts it to the reactionary right, which of course didn't exist yet within the Jewish world until about a decade or two later and the rise of Jewish neoconservatism. But he was basically making arguments about um, the failure of Jewish liberalism at a time when the only people that were making those arguments were people on the far left. Can you explain more about that dialogue with the uh, black liberation and black power movement? Because it is an interesting kind of back and forth, adapting and transforming their critique into a right-wing version of it. Uh, was he the only one who made that kind of use or exploitation of the critique of liberalism or the only one, let's say, from the Jewish community? Was that a, sort of a pioneering approach at that time? And what, what was that dialogue like? And where did it eventually lead the two Has this more or less frame it a love-hate relationship between the two? Oh, yes, very much so. I mean, he had a, he had a deep respect and hatred for... Uh, for black nationalists. He understood the black nationalist movement as a movement that was anti-integrationist, that saw itself as focused on creating a model of pride for African Americans. Black is beautiful. Uh, you know, Kahana basically, you know, offers the kind of Jews are beautiful. Black Panthers, Kahana has a chapter in his book, The Story of the Jewish Defense League, called Jewish Panthers. So he, he, he openly kind of adapted that model. But of course, he felt that the black nationalists were anti-Semitic and that, you know, blacks in America in general had adopted anti-Semitic anti, anti tropes or used anti-Semitic tropes. Um, so it, it's, 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 it's an interesting relationship. And I will say also that the Black Panthers and the Black Nationalists had an interesting relation with Kahana as well. They also had a certain kind of respect uh, for Kahana. So the, the question that Dahlia asked about, was he the only one to do it? Well, he was the only one that I know of that was able to do it within the realm of activism. There were other Jews at the time that were looking at Black nationalism and basically saying that Jews can flip that for their own benefit. In other words, they can use black nationalism as a template for Jewish identity. Um, there's a, there's a, a, a very good book by Mark Dollinger called Black Power Jewish Politics, which really kind of articulates how America, certain American rabbis were basically saying that the black nationalist movement could be seen as a, um, as a kind of uh, prescription for creating models of Jewish identity, which again was a critique of the Jewish liberal establishment that was experiencing high rates of assimilation and disaffiliation and so on and so forth. It's interesting what you say about his success in America and failure in Israel, even though intuitively it is the opposite, right? Because, you know, as, as you said, he was brushed out of uh, American uh, uh, Jewish historiography and in Israel he lives on, right? Kahana Chai. And right. I, I, I'd like to, to ask you, you know, looking at is the Israeli aspect of his career, uh, here in Israel, you know, barring Golda Meir, perhaps, uh, he is, I'd say, the most influential or maybe most remembered American Jew in Israel's political history. You mean, of course, other than Dalia Shenlin. Other than Dalia <laughs> Shenlin, of course, her future prime minister. Um, is it because you think that his politics is the only aspect of Jewish American politics that makes sense in an Israeli context and could thrive here? No, it's a good question. So uh, in the book, I make a distinction uh, between Kahanism and Neo-Kahanism, which I think is important. I think what we, what we see now in terms of certain political figures or political parties or other intellectuals who are, or activists who see themselves tied to Kahana, I think what when you listen to them, it's really a much more of a neo-Kahanist rather than a Kahanist approach. And I'll, I'll explain the difference in a moment. Kahana comes uh, to Israel 
thinking very much in American categories, American race categories and American political categories. For example, Kahana will say, and he's one of the first people on the Israeli right to come out in the 1970s and say that Jewish and democratic is completely schizophrenic, that there's no possibility of having a Jewish and democratic state. Now, that was something that was already expressed by people on the political left in Israel, but very few on the political right. And what he meant by that was that the only thing that really constitutes democracy is a liberal democracy. And if there's a liberal democracy, there has to be total equality between everyone that lives in the country, Jews and Arabs, which would then not make it a Jewish state. So, and that in a certain sense, when when Kahana says democracy, he means liberal democracy as if there's no other kind or an American style democracy. I think what ends up, the other thing is that Kahana, interestingly, has no interest in Rev. Cook or religious messianic, what, what's called religious messianic settler Zionism, right? The, in all of his writings about Zionism, he almost never mentions Rev. Cook. And the reason is, is that Rev. Cook is really offering a certain kind of Zionist romanticism built on certain principles of Kabbalah and mysticism and the kind of, you know, repopulating the land and so on. Kahana was really a figure that's simply about power. It was really about power and control. And he had no real... He had no real um, uh, religious ideology outside of that. He sees himself as a follower of Jabotinsky, but of course, that's a little problematic because Jabotinsky was somebody who was very, very strongly in favor of minority rights in Israel and in Europe. And there's a certain kind of humanism to Jabotinsky that people don't, don't often recognize. So what we're seeing now with the Kahanists now, why I'm calling them neo-Kahanists, is there's a kind of a merging between Cookian mystical ideology and a certain kind of politics of power. And that bringing those two together really in a certain sense becomes the kind of neo-Kahanist movement. But Kahana himself as a political thinker, I don't think there are any, there's anybody left that really follows the particular kind of, of ideology that, that he was espousing at that time. Well, this raises to me what I think is a real question that hung over my mind the whole time I was reading, which is, you know, you observe that he criticizes Jewish liberalism for losing, I think this is a quote, the substantive sense of Judaism. But his own ideas about Judaism seem to be grounded, as you pointed out, in protection, pride, power. But then that leads me to ask, what was his Judaism? What was his substantive sense of Judaism that he was trying so hard to protect? It wasn't about the messianic land redemption that we see in the Kukian ideas. And I, I just couldn't quite wrap my mind around what were his Jewish values? Was it law, theology, practice, or something else? Was it sort of a solipsistic protection and power of Judaism for its own sake? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a great question because putting him, you know, placing him within the kind of trajectory of Zionist thinking, he's not really a religious Zionist in any kind of cooking and sense. And he's not really a secular Zionist because secular Zionism for him is a, um, you know, make certain kinds of historical claims about the rights of the Jews to live in Israel and the Jewish homeland, which Kahana basically says is, is completely illegitimate. So as an example, he says very starkly, and I don't think any of the neo-Kahanists would necessarily say this, but he says very starkly in response to the racism law that, that expelled him from the Knesset, he said that, that the people that expelled him from the Knesset got it wrong, that the only racists are secular Zionists. Because for me, Kahana would say, and you know, that, um, you know, I believe that the Jews have a right to live here because I believe in the Torah and I believe that God gave the land to the, to the Jews. If you don't believe that, then you actually have no legitimacy for living there other than, other than racism. That's his response to Abi Ibn. Now, obviously, he's being tongue in cheek a little bit, but back to your question, what is the Judaism of Kahana is really an interesting one because it really is about a... Uh, a vehicle of power and control. And it doesn't, it's not really any more than that. I, I want to go back to what you said, uh, um, what we talked about earlier about him uh, as an intellectual, and you call him uh, in several places in the book a middle brow intellectual. And I like And now you proved it yeah. by saying that his Judaism doesn't have very much. No, no, but I, I'd like to, to, to unpack this a bit more and maybe some, uh, spend some time on it. Uh, because I was really taken aback. I, I was amazed to realize how prolific he was. You enumerate his the numerous books and and essays and articles that he published over the years. It's quite a quite a significant achievement. And I'd like to ask you, you know, 
given the relative paucity of his ideas, how would you characterize his his oeuvre, as it were, or, and uh, maybe uh, somewhat more uh, uh, to 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 narrow uh, down the the question a bit? Is it, does it stand up in uh, um, uh, de as detached from from his activism, or is it only does it only make sense as part of uh, an, an you know an activist approach? Yeah. So, uh, I mean, you're right. I mean, he really wrote voraciously for many for 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 the decades that he was in public life, and um, going through um, going through all of that material. I mean, thousands of pages because he was writing for the Jewish press every week. He was writing under pseudonyms for the Jewish press, and then of course he was writing his own books. And then at the end of his life, he publishes a book called Harayon Yehudi, the Jewish idea that's about 700 pages in Hebrew and about a thousand pages in English, which is a kind of purely uh, religious treatise of sorts. And I, I, I think that, um, that Kahana, and I talk about this in the book too, I think he kind of finds religion sometime in the late 1970s, once he launches his political career. His earlier work in the 1960s, and even the founding of the Jewish Defense League, is not really very much about Judaism or religion. It's really about the cultivation of a particular kind of nationalist diasporic pride. And, and, and I think what's an interesting point is that he says in his uh, manifesto of the JDL in 1968, that he founds the JDL as a way for Jews to um, fulfill the American dream. I mean, he really was a diasporist in the beginning. He, his book, Never Again, which was published in 1971, the year he, he moves to Israel, there's only one chapter on Zionism. It, it, for him, this, this, you know, his project early on was really a way to create a model for Jewish pride and Jewish identity that was going to counter post-Holocaust quiescence on the one hand, and that is those Jews who were survivors of the Holocaust who came to America, wanted to rebuild their lives, really didn't want to make too much noise, didn't want to make too much trouble, right? And then their kind of radicalized children who became part of the counterculture on the one hand, and also the American Jewish liberal project, which he said was going to undermine and destroy the survival of American Judaism. So in a way, to answer your question, I don't really think that you can separate the activism from the writing, except perhaps toward the end of his life when he really begins to write in earnest this this, this book called Harayoni Yudi, The Jewish Idea, which, it's, which it seems to be he was writing for decades. If you look at, uh, you know, if you look at his writings from the 1980s, particularly three books he wrote while he spent a year in Ramla prison, he spent a lot of time in prison. He spent a lot of time in prison in Israel, and he spent a year in prison in America, too, for breaking prohibition laws uh, in Pennsylvania. You see that by the time he's writing in Israel in Ramla prison, he's becoming very much a kind of an apocalyptic thinker. And he's basically prophesying the end of the state of Israel. This is why I think ultimately he 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 abandoned Zionism. And I think this is the difference between neo kahanism and Kahanism too. By the end of Kahana's life, he thought that Zionism was a failed project. It was just another form of American Jewish liberalism, which he called, you know, the Hellenistic project of the Jews. And I, that's different from a lot of the neo kahanas today who are very tied into Zionism because of Cookism in a certain way. And if you read, the, if you read Kahana's later work, Zionism just was a failure. And this raises so many questions, but maybe just for clarification, because, you know, many listeners, including, and I didn't necessarily know all the chapters of his life, and I know you're, this is not so much a biography chronologically as it is a history of his thought and understanding and development, but can you tell us some of the reasons why he was in jail in both places? I mean, you mentioned breaking probation, but to be on probation, you have right. to have broken a lot to begin with. Yeah, right. So, uh, ironically, well, he was, he, was, he was convicted of arms smuggling, illegal arms smuggling across state lines in America, and he was given a suspended sentence. And he moved to Israel immediately after that sentence, and then broke a whole series of probation laws, and he had to go back to America and spend a year in prison there. But in Israel, interestingly, he moves to Israel in 1971, in September of 1971, and you would think, okay, here's this guy, he's now a big Zionist, he's a Zionist because he decides that American Jewry is a failure, and he's going 
going to kind of engage in becoming you know, integrated into American society, is going to find a job, right? From the time that he, he emerges, to, from the time that he immigrates to Israel in September 1971 until October of 1972, he had been arrested something like 50 times. In one year? Right. In one year. And and the reasons, were, the reasons, had, the reasons had to do with uh, inciting violence, again, arms smuggling, he 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 tried and failed actually with the help of his brother to um, to to um, transport a cachet of Israeli IDF weapons to America to be used by the JDL, and this ended up becoming a big cause celeb for people. My, people back from the seventies, from the seventies, remember that. So, in a certain sense, interestingly, you would think as a Zionist, he comes to Israel instead of part trying to become part of the Israeli system. He, the moment he gets there, he tries to subvert the Israeli system. But he also joins it right away. But then he joins it. But his joining the system and his desire to become prime minister, which is that was what his really, you know, uh, was to overturn the country, basically. And turn it into what? And turn it into a kind of what he considered to be a real Jewish state. How would you characterize his reception in uh, the difference in the reception between uh, America that he leaves and Israel that he comes to? Well, that's a that's fascinating. So, Look Magazine, which doesn't exist anymore, but back then in the seventies, was a very popular magazine. Look Magazine took a took a poll of American Jews in nineteen seventy one and found that twenty five percent of American Jews had a positive view of the Jewish Defense League. So, the Jewish Defense League was not some kind of marginal, you know, wacky organization. It had chapters in major cities. It raised a lot of money. In 1972, Kahana had a feature interview in Playboy magazine, which I talk about a lot in the book. Uh, he had a feature interview in Esquire magazine, the Sunday New York Times. I mean, this is a person that was, a, that was really a national figure. And I think in the early 60s, uh, I'm sorry, in the late 60s, when the JDL first becomes an organization, there were, it was really basically promoting um, uh, certain kinds of uh, community patrols in difficult neighborhoods where elderly Jews were living amongst blacks and Puerto Ricans. And many people felt very positively about it. Now, it turned for a number of reasons because of his advocacy of violence and in particular, the downfall of the of the JDL in America happens in 1972, when supposedly, although they were never convicted, a group of JDL members had bombed the Saul Yurok uh, productions. Who who uh, Saul Yurok was a person who was bringing in a lot of Soviet um, uh, acts into America that ended up inadvertently killing a woman. At that point, really, that's the downfall of the JDL. Now, when Kana comes to Israel, um, he it's a very, very hard sell, right? First of all, you know, for those of you that know him or heard him speak, he's a very American figure. He spoke a very American Hebrew with American accent. He, there was this, there was something that was very foreign about him to a lot of Israelis. And he also he also spoke uh, in again, as I said, in these American categories. He tried to start an international chapter of the Jewish Defense League in Jerusalem, which never took off. And I think that he began to build a base among, interestingly, among Mizrahi Jews who felt discriminated against by the left-wing Ashkenazi elite government, the labor government. And around the time that Kahana comes, 1971, we have 1972, 73, the emergence of the Mizrahi Israeli Black Panthers, right? So there was a real sense of uh, a growing animosity among the Mizrahi population towards the political elites. And Kahana felt that he could use them for his own purposes, to build a base to fight against the Liberal Labor Party. But it turns out that it, it didn't work out that way, interestingly, because a lot of the Israeli Black Panthers also saw themselves in solidarity with the Arab population. And so they weren't, you know, there was a certain kind of triangulation of the Mizrahim, the Arabs, and the Ashkenazi elite that Kahana really had no answer to. And so that that kind of ended up falling apart. I think the important point is that when he finally does get elected in 1984, this sends shockwaves through the entire Israeli political system, not only on the left, but also on the right, right? From Yassi Sari to Geula Cohen, nobody was happy with the fact that he was elected. And what really actually became much more much more frightening is that in 1985, they did a poll 
And the polls showed that if Kahan, if there was an election in 1985, that Kahana's party would get 11 seats. This began the engine of the legislation of the racism law. In other words, the Knesset knew they had to do something to snuff this out. And that becomes, in a sense, the political or the ultimate political fall of Kahana's party. I find this fascinating because it sounds so much like the conversation around the last elections in Israel, when the party that's considered the neo-Kahanist party of Bezalel Smotrich and, ben, and uh, uh, Itamar Ben Gvir entered Knesset and, all, and the Israeli right left through to the Israeli right said, oh my gosh, is this who we've become? And so I feel like we're having the same conversations today. And that brings you back to another question. What well, you're looking at me funny. Is that you? Yeah, you, you no, read it that I would say, well, it, he, they were ushered in by Netanyahu himself, whereas Shamir, who was much more right wing, much more staunchly right wing than Netanyahu, refused to have anything to do with Kahana back in the, in the 80s. I think it's a completely different uh, uh, story here, but let, we, we, we have a guess. Let's not. <laughs> 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 but, but I do think that there were a lot of figures among the right, not necessarily the, Netanyahu or the political leaderships, but many people in the public who were saying, well, this looks bad for us and it's not who we are. So I think it did create divisions. But anyway, let's not get too sidetracked. But I am curious to go back to your point about if Kahana had had his way and he wanted to be prime minister and have the, the, the real Jewish state, what would that Jewish state have looked like in his eyes? Well, he talks about that in the Jewish idea. It's basically the creation of a kind of uh, monarch-like Jewish theocracy. Right now, he wasn't really interested so much in the in in um, uh, in you know advocating the establishment of the of Sabbath laws throughout the country and those. It wasn't so much halacha for him. It was really the establishment of what he would call the the quintessential abnormal state. That Israel is not a normal state. It's not a democracy. It shouldn't aspire to be a democracy, and that it has to deal with the Arab problem in a way that would that basically suggests that the Arabs either have to acknowledge their second class status, or they have to leave the country. Now, strangely enough, this notion of transfer, which Kahana advocated in the seventies was not something unknown about, um, among other political people on the right at that time. And not only that, but it was not something that was even unknown among people back in the 40s and 50s, like David Ben-Gurion, for example, who understood that one of the ways of solving the Arab problem was simply getting them to leave, or in the case of Ben-Gurion, not allowing them back after 1948. So in a certain way, Kahana articulated a very, what was considered to be radical political agenda that actually had antecedents in the very kind of belly of Zionist thinking back toward the beginning of the, or the post-war um, period. So in, in a sense, Kahana, Kahana always liked to say, right, I say what people think. This is something that was a very you know, common thing with him. And he was offering particular kinds of solutions to problems that were intractable within Israeli society, particularly on the question of the Arab minority population. And not only, uh, not only that, but the, but the intermingling of the Jewish and Arab population. One of the first things Kahana did when he came to Israel is he began a program advocating um, legislation to forbid Jewish and Arab dating. For example, I mean, it's right? just like Lahava. Like, you know, it's not a coincidence oh. they're called neo kahanists Yeah. Yeah. Yes. No. Lahava is taking on. It's very interesting. You have people like Ben Gvir who are trying to adopt a kind of the political project of Kahana, and play, groups like Lahava who are trying to adopt the cultural product of Kahana. And Kahana actually had both of them. It's interesting what you're saying. Uh, I mean, uh, our listeners uh, probably remember the numerous series that we had on populism and authoritarianism in, in, in around the world. And what, what you're saying, uh, that Kahana had this amazing uh, uh, talent to know where the uh, wind is blowing and to express the will of the people, as it were, right? To say what people think. Uh, it's really characteristic of, of the really typical populist leaders and politicians that we see around the world in recent years how how would you how, how do you look at him through this perspective is kahana like a quintessential populist yeah i think i think he he was a kind of a populist i think he he understood uh, the strength of certain fascist elements within a country in terms of creating stability um i think he was unafraid the way few Israelis were at that time to basically challenge democracy 
as a as a as a founding principle of Israel, of Israel as a state, and he didn't know why that why was democracy so sacrosanct. He believed very much in democracy, in a, except in Israel. So in in a book that he wrote <laughs> called Time, you no, know, but it's interesting. In a book that he wrote called Time to Go Home, he it's, this is this his swan song to America, and he's saying America is this amazing democracy. It's the best democracy that the world has ever seen. It's treated the Jews better than any other country, and yet it will not be able to prevent the rise of anti-Semitism. So if it can't work in America, it can't work anywhere. Israel, he claims, has to see itself as an abnormal state, which is in a certain sense very counter Zionism, right? It's not about the normalization of the Druze through the founding of, of a sovereign state. It's no, the state of Israel is an abnormal state, and it has to own that abnormality. It has to recognize it doesn't have to abide by the principles of justice and democracy that the rest of the world does. You would say to Kana, why is that? He would say, because that's what God commanded. And he, you know, he always comes back to that. He always comes back to that notion of, um, of, of abnormality that I think strangely enough, I mean, from my, from far away looking and keeping abreast at what's going on in Israel, that notion of abnormality, or let's call it Israeli exceptionalism, is something that's becoming more and more popular in certain sectors of the political Spectrum. It's interesting. I'm, I'm sorry, I have like an anti-intellectual question, but it's something that really I was really interested in uh, while reading your book. You, you say at, at some point that uh, um, much of the success of the JDL is owing to his really charismatic leader, leadership, you know, to him personally. And I wonder what was it like as a person? Was he like oozing charm or was he like an angry radical or both? Look, I didn't know him as a person. I, I was living in Brooklyn when he was still around, and I certainly knew some of the people from the JDL. But if you if you watch a lot of the YouTube clips that you find, I mean, a certain kind of charisma, um, a certain kind of humor, a certain kind of being able to channel the anger of an audience, a certain ability to be able to um, offer very, not necessarily simplistic, but certainly kind of binary solutions to more complex problems. I mean, I'll give you one example. In, I think it was 1986, he did a, he had a lot of debates. There are a lot of famous debates. Khan had one famous debate at Harvard University with Alan Dershowitz. He had another one with Yitz Greenberg um, in H, at HIR in Riverdale, the Hebrew Institute. Um, I would uh, I don't exactly know what, a, I think it's HIR, the Hebrew Institute of Religion in Riverdale. And if you watch that, I, I, I wrote an article about that separate from the book. You see that, you know, Yitz Greenberg, who was a very prominent kind of Orthodox rabbi, you know, he comes to the podium and he has a kind of a pile of books and he has a series of notes and he starts kind of giving his, you know, reasoned argument, which becomes the kind of moderate argument. And Kahana comes up, he swaggers up to the podium, takes out a crumpled piece of paper from his suit pocket, looks at it, puts it back, and then utterly destroys him. <laughs> utterly destroys him. Rhetorically, this is able to just basically undermine everything that, that Greenberg is saying. So he had, he, I, I think he had that ability. I think later in life, especially toward the end, he becomes much more erratic. He had all these kind of nervous tics. There was something very angry about him. I mean, I, I think not to overly psychologize my subject here, but I think he, I think he was, he was really, you know, he was kind of losing his mind in a way because after 1987, Israel basically abandons him by making his party illegal. He had already given up America on America. So he becomes a kind of homeless figure. And he doesn't really have a, 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 a he doesn't really have a program anymore. And you know, in a certain way one could ask, I think I might mention in the book like what what if Kahana had lived to old age? Right? What if he had lived another 20 years? What would have become of him? I don't think that he would have become a political leader in Israel. I think the neo-Kahanist movement would have emerged without him. I wouldn't be entirely surprised, but building on Gilad's question and what you pointed out about uh, not over-psychoanalyzing him, can we so over-psychoanalyze uh, you for a minute? I mean, I'm curious <laughs> what it was like to write this book for you, because, you know, based on, not to be presumptuous, but it seems like you come from a fairly different ideological background from Kahana himself, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you're also a professional and a scholar of Jewish thought, and at the same time, you open the book by saying that you really lived inside his head as he lived in yours while writing the book. What did that mean for you? Did you have to compartmentalize your own 
identity and ideology on these issues, or did you try to be in dialogue with the subject of your book? Um, I, I, tr- I, you know, I, I tried to be in dialogue. I will say that um, I actually come from what some would call the far left, and in a certain sense, in a certain sense, I kind of use Kahana's critique of liberalism from the right in order to make offer a critique of liberalism from the left. And this, you know, it's likened to the way that very kind of progress, some progressive scholars like to use Carl, like to use Carl Schmitt, right? Who was obviously a, a, a Nazi lawyer and, and legislator. And yet his whole program was a critique of the, of the, of the, of the Weimar, you know, the, the Weimar left. So in some way, He's he's useful to me because I think he really touches on the hazards of liberalism as a Jewish um, ideology of sorts. Uh, I don't agree with his answers for sure, obviously, uh, but you know he is to me, and this 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 is I don't I didn't end up writing this in the book. I probably should have. He is to me what Shabtai Tzvi is to Gershom Shalom. You did write it in the book. I did write in the book, okay. <laughs> right, yeah. So he is to me what Shabtai Tzvi is Gershom Shalom, meaning that what was Shabtai Tzvi for Gershom Shalom? The quintessential heretic who had a tremendous impact on everything after him. Right. All right, Professor Shaul Magid, uh, author of the forthcoming Meir Kahana, The Public Life and Political Thought of an American Jewish Radical. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you. And many thanks to uh, Itai Shalem, the manager of TLV1 Studios, as well. And now we've got a request, because many or most of you listen to us on the Apple Podcast app, and we would like to ask you to please write us a review of any kind. Five stars, preferably, but not only. You too can support us by going to our, uh, to our website and subscribing onto our Patreon campaign. Check out our archive. It has about 700 interviews to keep you entertained and hopefully annoyed. Like us on Facebook, follow me, Dahlia, and the podcast on Twitter. And of course, join us again next week for another edition of the Tel Aviv Review. And until then, from Dahlia and from me, goodbye. Goodbye.